This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Scott Hepburn, Bjorn Andre, and Jeff Wilkes. Coming up on DTNS, does Microsoft Game Pass lose money? Maybe it does. Disney will turn a live hockey game into animation on the fly. And who should be the most embarrassed about their generative AI? We'll tell you. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, February 14th, St. Valentine's Day to those who celebrate. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. From lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Straffolino. From the Modern Rogue World Headquarters outside of Austin, Texas, I'm Brian Brushwood. Uh, and I'm the show's producer, Roger Shane. And a happy Saints Day to all of you. I, I, I was just thinking about Saints. It's a very religious day, St. Valentine's Day. Right? It's true. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let's not sully it by sticking around talking about things that we shouldn't. Let's start with the quick hits. Microsoft officially retired Internet Explorer in June last year, but Wednesday it put it to rest for good. Disabling the browser through a Microsoft Edge update on most versions of Windows 10. Now, there's still a few survivors out there. Exceptions include Microsoft's long-term servicing channel for Windows 10 and versions like the Windows 10 China Government Edition, but most of them are gone. Uh, Microsoft's MS, HTML, and Trident engines will still be supported, though, and the company says it will support IE mode in Edge through at least 2029. That's not all, though. Microsoft also laid to rest its Yammer enterprise social network. It will slowly be changed into Viva Engage anywhere that it hasn't been renamed already. In I'm shocked, shock news, Twitter has delayed the launch of its new paid API by a few more days. The company had previously announced that the new API would be launching on February 9th. Then it subsequently delayed that to the 13th, what we call today as yesterday. And it's now been postponed for a few more days. With no specific date this time, seemingly they've learned their lesson. The paid API will allow developers to access premium features, including more data and higher access limits, for a fee. Twitter said the delay was part of our efforts to create an optimal experience for the developer community. Good luck with that. <laughs> Amazon CEO Andy Jassy told the Financial Times that the company is hopeful it can decide on a physical retail format this year that it will then, quote, go big on. Now, this is interesting considering Amazon has been kind of retreating from retail, uh, closed most of its bookstores, all of its four-star shops and its pop-up shops, and it took a $720 million loss last quarter due to slowing grocery sales. While it figures out a successful format for retail this year, though, it is already making advances in autonomous cars. Amazon's Zooks carried passengers in its fully autonomous electric vehicle on public roads for the first time on a one-mile stretch between the company's two main buildings in Foster City, California. Zooks' vehicles have no controls or pedals and can carry up to four passengers at a time. As of March 16th, Instagram creators will no longer be able to tag products during live stream. This marks a continued retreat for Meta from live shopping. It shut down the same capability on Facebook back in October. While live shopping remains extremely popular in Asian markets using apps like WeChat, Taobao Live, and Doyen, it's been a tough nut to crack in the U.S. And it's not just Meta. Back in July, TikTok abandoned plans to expand its live shopping to the U.S. and to Europe. Electric vertical takeoff and landing, or EVTOL, aircraft company Joby Aviation said it began final assembly of its prototype and expects to begin test flights of it by mid-year. Last week, Joby received full FAA Part 23 certification that the aircraft's design conforms to safety requirements and standards set by the US FAA. That allows it to test the prototype. The next step is to get production certification so it can mass produce them. The company hopes to begin commercial operations in 2025. All right, uh, let's start off with this groundbreaking revelatory uh, revelation. It's a revelatory revelation, Rich. What is it? <laughs> yes. Well, last week, the UK's Competition and Markets Authority released a report of its provisional findings related to Microsoft's proposed acquisition of, say it with me now, Activision Blizzard. One of the main concerns is that Microsoft, if Microsoft gets Activision, then it gets Call of Duty, and if it gets Call of Duty, that could be used to hurt Sony. Of course, Microsoft has sworn up and down that it will not restrict Call of Duty from 
PlayStation. They said it'll give it to anybody that wants it. But some folks have pointed out that if Microsoft includes Call of Duty games on day one on its Game Pass subscription, it could hurt PlayStation sales. Although back in 2018, Xbox head Phil Schiller said releasing a game on Game Pass increased sales. So, Tom, what's changed? Yeah, uh, a lot of things. COVID, for example. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Forgot. But also, uh, it's been five years and they've gathered more data on Game Pass. So the game community got a little excited when gamesindustry.biz found this little passage deep within the 277-page UK report. It said, Microsoft also submitted that its internal analysis shows a redacted percentage decline in base game sales 12 months following their addition on Game Pass. We don't know what that percentage is, but... It's a decline. The report also notes that Activision historically opposed including games in its subscription services or in other subscription services because it severely cannibalizes sales of games. Kotaku notes that it has seen internal documents from Xbox that said that adding games to Game Pass would lead to cannibalization of digital sales. And while all of this clearly looks bad for one aspect of Microsoft's argument for why it should be allowed to buy Activision Blizzard, uh, in other words, it might actually hurt game sales, more of the rhetoric out there that I've seen seems to be people talking about Game Pass being a money loser somehow. Brian, what do you think? Uh, is Xbox Game Pass a money loser? Is that bad? What, 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 there's two things to chime in on, one of which is uh, when it comes to monopoly concerns, uh, keep in mind that the number one platform on the entire planet is Steam. It's not Xbox. It's not PlayStation. Uh, but beyond that, Keep in mind that uh, in the old days, uh, I, I think everybody on the panel remembers the days of piracy. Ooh, uh, we piracy. also remember yeah, the remember days that. where people tried to have it both ways. HBO mm -hmm. tried to have it both ways, where they would brag about the fact that Game of Thrones was the most pirated uh, content on, on the internet, uh, and, and yet also did not offer a legitimate way to get it. So Game Pass, uh, number one, it's slow, it's awkward, it's fumbly. It, uh, if you stream it, you, you've got some soupy lag to it and all that. Uh, it seems to me like it's white hat piracy, basically hmm. a way, a way to, even if it does lose money, what it does is it keeps people, in 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 our ever evolving theory of of, of convenience trumping fidelities, uh, it, it's so convenient that that people won't bother to actually pirate things. Yeah, why why mess with torrents when you can just pay this low low fee and get and get everything easily and, and, and get yeah. an equally crappy version of the experience. <laughs> yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a but but uh, all in one place. Uh, yeah, I, I I don't know, Rich. What do you think of that? The I, I definitely think, I mean, convenience beating free piracy is kind of a proven model for the most part. I mean, definitely we, we're willing to accept, you know, a lower bitrate song, uh, you know, in exchange for the supreme convenience of having it anywhere. And uh, game streaming is new enough that we're still kind of figuring out, OK, how <laughs> what's the minimum level of bad that we need that we can put this out here? But what's sticking to my mind looking at uh, this is the idea we now, you know, th this statement that internal analysis shows a uh, percentage decline in base game sales 12 months. That's like all I'm assuming that means all games in aggregate that. Uh, uh, yeah, that we don't know how it breaks down. Yeah. Right. That's a good we, point. So what stands out to me is Schiller's argument with why uh, Xbox or Game Pass increases game sales is that it leads to more visibility on platforms uh, like Twitch. Uh, hilariously, you mentioned Mixer at the time. So, like the, I still think that's a valid argument when you're talking about smaller games that need to get visibility out there. If that's free in game or free, if it's included in the Game Pass subscription. Probably a lot more people will play it and you'll see more people playing it on, on stream and stuff like that. Call of Duty doesn't need that. Every like Call of Duty does not need discoverability uh, when there's a new release out there. So I, I, I think that this is probably a more nuanced conversation of Schiller said this or he said that. Uh, I, than, than we I, wanted, I am maybe. really not interested in, in going back to Schiller's five year old statement mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and talking about whether he meant it or not. I bet if you could get Phil Schiller on the record, he would say like, yeah, that was true in 2018. It's not anymore. I think it's as simple as that. Uh, I, I do think that Microsoft's response to this was telling where they just talked about, yeah, we want to we want to make developers money. They did not deny anything out of this because 
you can make more money with a subscription service even while reducing sales because you've got guaranteed monthly revenue. Somebody spends $70 on one game, uh, they may or may not buy another game for a while. If you're getting $10 a month out of them, that's guaranteed revenue. So that, that, it may well, make and, more and, sense for Microsoft to say like, yeah, it might reduce game sales, but in the end, it's going to make us more money. And even though you get discounted DLC in Game Pass, you still have to pay that. So if everyone oh, is sure. getting yeah, yeah. apps and stuff like that, you know, th there are revenue streams for uh, for developers and for Microsoft, of course, uh, that exist, you know, kind of within that Game Pass subscription. Uh, this is a little bit like the success mirage, and I, I don't mean that in a mean way when I talk about the S&P 500, where uh, the S&P 500 uh, statistically, I, I don't know, 10, 12 uh, percent year over year adjusted for inflation forever and ever and ever. But part of the reason it's able to achieve that is because it drops the losers and picks up new possible winners. And, and it could be that Game Pass has the same kind of thing going. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's a good point too. I, I really do think in the end, this little passage is not good for Microsoft's argument to acquire Activision Blizzard. It's not deadly. They've got other arguments that they can use. It's already looking unlikely for other reasons. Uh, but I don't think it means that Game Pass is somehow a bad business idea uh, for Microsoft for lots of the reasons that, that we've mentioned here. All right. Old folks like us typically first engaged with pro sports, maybe on television or even the radio. But younger viewers like you uh, out there listening more often use TikTok or Instagram to check out what happened in a game. So the NHL is going to use its analytics tech to try to get younger viewers interested in watching a full game. Yeah, the NHL will animate a live game on March 14th between the Washington Capitals and the New York Rangers called the NHL Big City Greens Classic. The game will feature characters from the TV show Big City Greens alongside animated versions of actual hockey players using the NHL Edge system to track the players and the puck. It'll also feature commentators reacting to some of the action from those animated characters from Big City Greens. While the unaltered game will broadcast on ESPN, so, you know, if that's how you want it, it's available. You can watch the animated version on Disney Channel, Disney XD, and Disney Plus. The NHL's SVP of Business Development, David Lahasky, said this is just a test, but that data from NHL Edge could make it possible to do things like customize game broadcasts in Roblox or Minecraft. Yeah, Fred819 in our chat is already going so like NFL Slime Time on Paramount. Uh, people, you, you might think of them, the Manning alternate commentary. Like there's there's examples of people doing this already. Uh, Brian, it, it seems like this is a cool aspect of having infinite channels uh, versus the old days when you only had three or four that you, it makes more sense to try out something and try to garner a new audience. Yes, and it's also a moment to take a moment and, and take stock of your own values. Do you value like the quote unquote real story or do you value the myths and legends that we project onto our various sports teams, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because um, uh, uh, ultimately all sports is a random number generator, but one that that is especially with like a uh, big city greens which is an excellent show i, I will vouch for uh, uh -huh. a, a, is a good way for preteens to eventually care about the random noise generator and then eventually at the age of 17 18 they're going to figure out oh wait that was the eagles the whole time <laughs> really <laughs> you know yeah yeah or an turns out i'm an yeah. eagles fan yeah uh i i uh, was uh, I did an interview with Derek Gould. He's the uh, baseball writer for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. It'll be on A Word with Tom Merritt next week. And in that interview, he talked about how his son engages with baseball in an entirely different way than we did growing up, uh, which is, is what we were talking about at the beginning, is using TikTok. Uh, they, the, he just looks at uh, highlights. Uh, and, and so finding a way to attract folks to watch sports may not be important to society, uh, but it's certainly important to sports uh, and sports franchises and people who like sports. So this is a, a really interesting attempt. And 
I don't think this is the end of it. I can't wait to see what other takes people are going to have on sports. You may turn up your nose and say, ah, this is this is silly. I just want to watch the game. Great, you can. ESPN's going to give you just the game. You don't have to watch the Big City Greens version of it uh, any more than you have to listen to the Manning commentary on Monday Night Football or anything else. I I, I want to see more of this. I want to see some some full-on like sci-fi uh, visualization uh, creations. Uh, turn turn a, turn a football game into Quidditch. I don't know. Uh, that, the, the mind boggles. There, there's, there's part of me that wonders whether or not it's already happening. For example, my 18-year-old daughter is really into baseball, which is a complete nonsense engine. Mm-hmm. All of the names of the teams are nonsense. The commissioner is nonsense. Everything's nonsense. Uh, and it's all random number generator. But what if baseball were to recreate, let's say, 1947 World Series, number for number, and then <laughs> reveal... Oh, yeah. By the way, the St. Louis tacos were actually taking on, you know, we're actually the the White Sox or what have you. Yeah, yeah. Or or uh, or the St. Louis Brown Sox. Is that a thing? It was in the 1800s. <laughs> 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 All right, uh, folks, what do you want to hear us talk about on the show? We get a lot of our best story ideas from you. And one way to let us know is our subreddit. Submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Well, technologies lumped under the very general term AI are making news a lot these days. Just in the last 24 hours, here's just a quick rundown of, of some of the news that's out there. Automatic voice transcription company Otter AI launched Otter Pilot that automates meeting notes. DARPA announced Monday that its Air Combat Evolution team has developed software that has successfully flown an F-16 multiple times with a human on board for safety and for planetary peace. Former Google chairman and founding member of the U.S. government's Defense Innovation Board, Eric Schmidt, told Wired about Istari, a machine learning system to virtually assemble and test military equipment like tanks. And on a lighter note, BuzzFeed originally or officially launched its Infinity Quizzes that use OpenAI's API to create a personal narrative based on just a few questions. You just answer a few questions, it comes up with something totally distinct every time. The first round of these quizzes include create your own rom-com and date your celebrity crush. Tom, which one of these stood out to you? Create your own rom-com, I think. Wait, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you meant of all the AI uh, stories. Yeah, uh, uh, in- interesting to see the F-16 thing. Uh, it, it definitely had a human pilot on board, and the idea is to to make a more capable autopilot, uh, so that the the pilot, the human pilot, can can focus on a, intelligence gathering, targeting uh, things like that. So th- that's fascinating. Uh, and and the BuzzFeed thing. All kidding aside, the Infinity quizzes. I can't wait to to try these out. If you're a Good Day Internet uh, listener, if you're a patron, uh, stick around. We're we're going to try a couple of these out collaboratively uh, with the crew after Daily Tech News Show is over. <laughs> What about you, Rich? Uh, the Ot- Otter Pilot, uh, I already use Otter AI for like show notes for uh, It's a Thing or transcripts for there. And so like all of this is doing is taking what is already a very reliable transcription product. I mean, I don't want to say all it's doing. I, I give it some credit. But it's taking that and doing a lot more real-time stuff. It's giving you real-time notes and making it easier for people that are either dipping in and out of meetings or not in meetings. Like as someone who wants to avoid meetings as much as possible, any way that you can have a way to passively absorb that information while I'm ignoring a meeting is always welcome. So uh, I'm, I'm super interested in, in stuff like that. All right, but the main thrust of the AI-related news is the search engine race still. And at a conference Monday, Alphabet's chairman, John Hennessy, uh, you, you were like, wait a minute, Alphabet's chairman's name is uh, John Hennessy? Yeah, chairman of the board of the directors. Uh, generally sticks to, to strictly financial takes. You don't hear him talking about the business a lot. Uh, but this time he did. He got on the record and he made some headlines saying he thinks generative AI is still a year or two away from being truly useful. He said, quote, I think Google was hesitant to productize this because it didn't think it was really ready for a product yet. But I think as a demonstration vehicle, it's a great piece of technology. That's all fine. He's reacting to the fact that Google took a lot of heat when it tweeted a GIF with results from the Bard generative AI that they are adding to Google that had an incorrect fact related to which Telescope discovered the first exoplanet. 
I, I gave him a lot of heat for that, not because the AI got it wrong, but because they didn't catch it and they tweeted it out as an example. Just, just a bad human move. Monday, search engine researcher Dimitri Bremerton pointed out that Bing also displayed factual errors during Microsoft's demonstration last week. For example, it gave a measurement for the cord length for a cordless vacuum that, you know, cordless so didn't have a cord. Uh, and when asked questions about a financial document, it made a bunch of errors, including incorrectly referring to unadjusted gross margin as gross margin, uh, as well as incorrectly calculating operating margin. Th things that I would do probably, uh, but you, if you're relying on this thing, you wouldn't want it to do. So What's the takeaway here, Brian? Is Bing just as bad as Google when it comes to generative AI? Or is it as simple as just none of these tools are good yet? Uh, no, it's not as good. And it doesn't have to be as good. That's the beauty of being Pepsi to somebody else's Coke. So it's like it's on Google uh, as somebody who appears to have been asleep at the wheel to verify this. Like, oh, no, we know all about this. We're here for it. Unfortunately, it was a human disaster that they published the wrong fact on on their socially promoted gif on there meanwhile bing is in the unique position where it's like uh, can anybody expect less from bing no <laughs> so as a result they get to do whatever and they get be, get to be as wrong as you want all i know is that bing is doing something and google is messing up that's that's all i read as a consumer yeah yeah that's that that's the rhetoric out there you're absolutely right yeah, it's kind of this uh, a, a a challenger brand or whatever you want to call. It. You know, I'm thinking of the Pepsi Coke comparison specifically, yeah. but or Avis you know, and Hertz. Yeah, but look at what the the products that Microsoft launched this with, right? Things that are are in no way uh, a key to their revenue stream. It's part of the like the benefit of them having a very diversified. Uh, 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 sources of revenue for the company, right? They can afford to take a risk on Bing. They can afford to take a risk on Edge, which is, you know, a, a second or third place browser, uh, uh, depending on on what uh, graphs you're looking at, what market share you're looking at. So it's it's not, they don't have the number one browser. They don't have the number one search. And so they can be super aggressive with this and say, you know, we, we can gather some data. If, if nothing else, we can get a ton of data to make this better so that as we start rolling it in, they're already starting to roll it into Word stuff, but more visibly rolling it into Office and some of the stuff where they have a lot more productivity stakes, a lot more, I guess, to lose in a lot of ways that uh, they can make sure that their products are ready, which is usually a strategy that Google makes, right? When Google wants to disrupt something, I, I'm thinking of something like Google Docs, like, yeah, we'll roll out the bad thing first and you can use it for free and who cares? It's free and it's something you didn't have before. And yeah, we're going to make it a lot better. It's a very different situation where Google is in the driver's seat with search and the driver's seat with Chrome, things they don't want to screw up because they're very good for their business that is not very diversified. And all of a sudden they can, you know, they, they find that they're having to play catch up potential or definitely with Microsoft. Well, and, and the uh, uh, canonical uh, uh, parallels that we would make is Hertz, number one, driving a, a rental car company or whatever. Avis being in number two, they say we're number two, we try harder. Uh, in the case of Google, we're Google. In the case of Bing, it's like Bing, we're trying things like, like, like that's powerful. And, yeah, and I think yeah, yeah. a lot of yeah. people are on board for it. I no, that's a great answer. Dimitri Bremerton in his article, which was, was well done. was like, why is everybody giving Bing a pass? I think Brian just answered the question that that's why everyone is, is, or not everyone, but a lot of people are giving Bing a pass. Uh, I used open AI's chat GPT to write a bunch of the quick hits today. Uh, I never let the text stand as it was. I had to, I had to use, I had to modify it, uh, multiple times. Every time it put a date, it was wrong. It said that the, the Twitter API had been delayed to the 14th. It was the 13th. Uh, it said that Joby was going to do, uh, its commercial operations in 2024. It was 2025. Uh, so yeah, uh, I had to go back and, and look at these and go like, wait, uh, is everything in here? Right? Nope. It's not, but it was still faster. It still laid the scaffolding uh, for me. It saved me time. And, uh, and, and, and they're, they're also, despite the fact that they're claiming that this is not ready for prime time, what have you, but but like there are realtors that are using it to create flowerly, flowerly language for yeah, yeah. various, you know, cottages and so on. It's, it's being used. It's yeah. going to get better. 
it's just good. It's not good at everything right now. The the thing that gets me is, is these uh, analysts who, who always say, and there's dozens of them and I respect every single one of them, but they always say like, uh, the problem with chat GPT is it confidently states things are wrong. It's, there's nothing confident about it. It just spits out words one after the other. <laughs> You're reading in the confidence. You shouldn't have the confidence in it. You should be skeptical about it. And then it won't seem confident. It'll just seem like a helpful tool. I, I definitely asked uh, chat G, GPT, I asked, what's wrong with Brian Brushwood? And it refused to answer, which I uh, respect. <laughs> <laughs> not, not for me to tell you, said chat GPT. Yeah. All right. Well, James Brown, a graphics engineer at Weta Workshop, formerly made news by upgrading tiny Lego computers with screens that can display wireframe targeting animations and scrolling text basic stuff but still impressive now his computers have built-in usb-c ports some even have touch controls and brown now even casts his own resin lego bricks but what is hardware really if it can't play doom brown successfully demonstrated running the game on one of his lego uh power bricks for a a few months ago they draw power from a usb connection on a disconnected lego power brick with a nine volt battery inside Brown recently converted the electronics inside the bricks into a wearable, self-contained ring, running the RP2040 version of Doom with custom code, optimizing it for a gray scale display. You can't actually control the action on screen while wearing the ring, but Brown says he may build a new version with flexible materials so the ring is more durable. Uh, wearable Doom, truly, this, I mean, forget ChatGPT, now the future we live Perfect in. Valentine's Day gift. <laughs> Slightly pedantic take here. There's a difference between displaying Doom being played and actually playing Doom. I, I didn't see any controls in any of that. F- fair enough. Fair enough. This is this is just a circuit board. It has 16K flash memory, 16K flash memory, oh, and, and 4K of RAM. So it's not going to run Doom, but it, it's an impressive monitor, don't, wouldn't yeah. you say? You know? Yeah. Oh, uh, 73 Very by 40 monitor. OLED. Uh, yeah. That's my dream display right there. All right, uh, folks, we appreciate you being with us, and uh, we would like you to thank Brian Brushwood. Go to Twitter, at Schwood, say thank you, Brian, for being on Daily Tech News Show. Uh, Brian, where else should people go? You know what? I'll do you one better. Why don't you head on over to uh, greatestconpodcast.com and listen to the first two seasons of World's Greatest Con, because season three is coming. We're talking about weeks, days, like 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 40-something days until it comes out. It's a uh, give or take a big secret what it is. It's very, very good. Get Get caught up. I, I will say only this about it. Brian gave me a sneak peek. Uh, I listened to the first episode thinking like, you know what? I'm sure it's good. Uh, but for my buddy, Brian, I'm going to make sure I set aside a little bit of time uh, to listen to it as much as I can. And I finished the whole GD series. Uh, I could not <laughs> stop myself. Uh, you're going to love it. Even if you read the description, you're like, I don't know. That sounds interesting. But just just start uh, because you'll want to you'll want to gobble up the whole thing. All right. Well, thanks also to our brand new boss, Chris, who just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Chris. Chris, Chris, you made our day. Uh, Chris, Chris made this show possible with, along with all the other patrons, all the other patrons. Welcome Chris to the club uh, at patreon.com slash DTNS. Uh, and folks, you could be the next Chris. Go, go join up patreon.com slash DTNS, where if, if you are already a patron, stick around, uh, you can get the commercial free version of the show, uh, including good day internet starting right now with a Buzzfeed quiz. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UT. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young on a Wednesday. Oh my gosh, talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>